Hello, students. This is Professor Gore. Um, this is um, another recorded lecture, and this one is uh, the PowerPoint that will follow directly after uh, talking about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, this PowerPoint will still talk about Thomas Jefferson because of his role right before the War of 1812. But really, this recorded lecture is going to focus on the War of 1812 and, and what leads up to it, what happens in the war and the short term effects of it. Um, as well as uh, the Hartford Convention and kind of the end of the Federalist Party. Um, and then the, in the next recorded lecture, when we get to the era of good feelings, we'll talk about uh, what one party rule kind of looked like um, for those few years. So what ends up happening, as uh, some historians kind of call the War of 1812, the second war for American independence, um, I like to call it the war for respect. Um, we weren't really getting respect, or I'd say we uh, as the United States wasn't really getting respect um, from particularly Britain and France and other foreign entities uh, with our trade in the Caribbean, our trade going on the Mediterranean Sea trade or in Europe. Um, and so really Europeans problems kind of just flow on down the hill and ends up uh, uh, kind of getting us covered in muck. So if you remember previously in module two, the French Revolution leads to all kind of havoc in Europe. Um, France goes to fighting just about all their neighbors um, other monarchs are worried that this revolution is going to spill over to overthrow them and lead to their execution. And what eventually ends up um, emerging at the end of all that chaos um, is a very talented um, and one of the most uh, famous uh, or infamous, depending on your side of the conflict, uh, people in world history, and that's Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, kind of a self-made man rose up through the ranks of, of being a very talented general. And um, he sees power and thankfully uh, agreed to end the quasi naval war with John Adams, if you remember that, and um, um, kind of sells the Louisiana Purchase to us, which we covered in a, in a previous lecture, um, because he needed men, or money to pay for men to attack the rest of Europe. So from basically 1801 to about 1815, Europe saw on and off war because of Napoleon. So that causes lots of chaos. Uh, all these nations were fearful of him. Um, he had defeated Austria, Prussia, um, defeats a Russian army at some point. Um, the British struggled uh, against him, but the British had the most powerful navy in the world. Napoleon had considered an invasion and Britain had definitely prepared for one, uh, but he was fearful with their navy that he it would be disastrous to try to invade the British Isles. So, um, to make a long story short, there is conflict. Uh, Britain is trying to prevent France from importing goods. France is trying to prevent Britain from importing goods. And the United States is just caught in the middle, uh, kind of getting hit with side punches uh, as punches are getting thrown at each other. So what I mean by those side punches, I'm talking about um, our vessels get attacked, even though we're neutral and we're just trying to make a buck and, and, and make money off of uh, – trading with, with uh, different different entities in Europe and in the Caribbean. And what's end up happening is, is you're having impressment. So if you remember impressment was this term we used where um, an opponent or even just another nation would stop your vessel, um, kidnap some of your sailors and force them to be in your Navy, and at times steal your cargo. Now they would release the ship with some of the men, but you lost some of your best sailors and potentially you lost your valuable cargo, which is, what you were going after to begin with. So uh, impressment is one of the two causes of the War of 1812. Uh, the other one is that the British are going to continue to arm Native Americans in the Midwest or the old Northwest Territory, whatever you want to call it. And so those are going to be the two causes of the War of 1812. So um, basically Europe's problems spill into the U.S. and we're going to have to deal with this junk. Okay, so Basically, between 1801 and 1802, Napoleon, uh, in 1815, Napoleon is going to be fighting all kind of junk. Um, he fights Spain, Portugal, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and so forth. Uh, his big disaster was invading Russia in the winter. Um, Hitler makes that mistake later in U.S. history, too, that we cover uh, in the 1940s. Uh, but remember, you can only invade Russia in, in winter if you are one group, and that is the Mongols. Uh, they're the only people to do it successfully, and they actually intentionally invaded in the winter so their their horses could get a better grip on the frozen tundra. So um, the Mongols are arguably some of the toughest people in world history. You're not going to invade Russia in the winter and be successful unless you're the Mongols. So um, what's what's going to – this impressment and, and so forth is going to um, mess up our merchant marine, okay, so our merchant ships – 
Um, it did uh, danger American business. Okay, you want to upset Americans, you just, um, prevent their ability to make a living for their families. Uh, France, as I mentioned, cut off ports, imports to Britain. Britain did the same thing. Um, Pressman occurred um, by both sides. Okay, in fact, it was thought we might go to war with, with France at one point, but France would be, uh, doesn't want to deal with us. They they uh, they want to deal with the rest of Europe. So Britain alone seized eight thousand sailors alone. Can you imagine? Just 8,000 American soldiers just getting captured. Um, but that's 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 how bad things were. Now, if this would have been in, in modern day at times, the United States is far stronger. We were, would have stood up to Britain much sooner. Uh, but you got to realize that we're, we're still a young kind of um, um, toddler nation, so to speak. I, I don't know if we're still in the infant stage, but we're, we're growing and uh, growing rapidly, but still not kind of the big kid on the block yet. And so we're going to get caught in the middle of that. So this was the uh, different decrees and so forth about what's happening um, and agrees to this impressment and, and yada, yada. These are, um, if you want a definition of impressment, there it is right there. Um, so anyway, um, basically it's like, you're going to do this to me, I'm going to do this to you. So go back and forth. Um, but then in 1806, Jefferson is president. He was elected in 1800, comes in office in 1801, leaves in um, 1809. But in the second term, uh, a, a vessel um, by the, called the, the Chesapeake was um, actually uh, in the um, Chesapeake Bay. And it wasn't even 10 miles off the coast. I mean, you could, on a clear day, probably see land with a, a, a scope of some sort. And... Um, they basically, the British ship, the Leopold, fired at uh, the American vessel, the Chesapeake, and they impressed um, our sailors. Now, the captain uh, for the United States, who Rod, did not want to give up and uh, fired back. And, and anyway, the British ship um, basically uh, was more powerful. Three Americans were killed uh, and wounded and about four sailors impressed. Now, this is not an American vessel that was traveling in a French harbor. This is an American vessel 10 miles off the U.S. coast, okay? That was, that's what you would call a declaration of war today. Um, but it's 1806, Jefferson did not want to go to war. That's actually not what happens. He does something actually dumber business-wise, and it's called the Embargo Act, okay? So um, basically, at this time in 1806, Americans are like, screw the British, let's go to war, let's do this thing. Now, this is a famous and funny political cartoon um, and so this, uh, turtle snapping turtle is biting this guy. He says, so, Oh, this cursed will grab me. Well, that's embargo backwards. And basically what Jefferson's solution was, well, if we're going to stay out of war, we're just not going to trade with anybody. So basically he shut off water commerce. Okay. Marine commerce across the globe because of Britain and France. Now, um, I can certainly understand a president want to keep us out of war, and that's definitely respectable, but I've never heard a historian say that that was not a dumb economic move in American history. Regardless of your political views, historians are in unanimous agreement that that was a dumb move economically. Now, we understand where he's coming from. He's trying to keep us out of war, but nonetheless, it shuts off all commerce. So how are we going to make a living for ourselves? So American um, you know, merchants kind of did it under the table. And so it really hurts American businesses. And one of the things, though, that we, we did that kind of was an unintended consequence is New England, um, who had really had a thriving economy off, and, off of uh, ocean trade, began to transition from just trading to industry. Now, that's significant because in the 1810s, 1820s, 1830s, 1940s, their textile industry is going to take off and they're going to be one of the wealthiest entities in the country. The only areas that may have been wealthier were just the, the wealthy planters, uh, maybe like uh, Natchez, Mississippi area that were millionaires and so forth. Um, New England gets really upset. They uh, talk of secession. It's kind of ironic that South Carolina is the first state to see from the Union. And so it's often taught that just the Southerners were the first ones to talk of secession. Actually, it was New Englanders, uh, the Northerners, back in the uh, first decade of the 1800s to uh, excuse me, to end up getting rid of it. Now, it only lasts for about a year and a half, a little less. And um, um, 
Madison, when he comes into office, is like, hey, we got we got to get rid of this. Um, so Madison had cooler, kind of wiser, cooler heads prevailed. So the Chesapeake incident happened in 1806. I think it officially, the embargo goes into effect, 1807, 1808 time period. So um, anyway, really, it's what Jefferson is kind of like known for, for not being a very good president, uh, because the embargo was just not a good economic move. Anyway, so Madison replaces it with what's called the Non-Intercourse Act. Okay, it has nothing to do with, with any kind of uh, uh, intercourse, as you would think. But what the Non-Intercourse Act basically said that we will do business with everybody but Britain and France. Okay, so we're going to trade with Holland. We're going to trade with uh, the German states. We're going to trade with Russia. We'll trade with Portugal and Spain. We're not going to trade with Britain and France. That's what that means. Now, what was going on in the West that uh, was causing quite a bit of a stir was uh, if you remember in, in a previous lecture, we talked about the Indian Confederation led by Little Turtle, um, a Miami war chief. And um, typically in American history, when tribes unite, they tend to put a beat down on the American military forces. Um, one of the most revered Native American leaders of all time, um, some historians say he's probably a little bit over glorified. And then some would say he's probably not given enough credit um, Oftentimes when you kind of have legendary status, there's things that you're, they're downplayed and there's things that are emphasized even more so than probably what should have. But Tecumseh was a brilliant leader uh, without question. Um, um, very, uh, had engaging and a, uh, attractive personality to people to his cause. Um, and so what he called for was Native Americans returning to their traditional Native American religion of animism. And to try to resist white settlement and kind of create their own lands in the Midwest and just prevent, you know, white Americans from coming in there and taking their lands. Um, he, he proposed tribes to unite. Uh, excuse me. He also um, encouraged and, and, and tried to unite the tribes in the old Southwest or we call the Southeast today. So he was trying to get the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws, Chickasaws, Seminoles and others to join forces. Now, had Tecumseh been successful at doing that, um, at least for a decade or quite a bit longer, probably, Native Americans would have been able to resist white settlement because of fear of war or whatever. They, Even though the Americans outnumbered them, Tecumseh with the Confederation would have caused enough of a military backlash uh, with armaments from the British and the Spanish that they would have actively actively resisted the United States. Okay, and who knows? There may be Native American nation um, in the Midwest and some of the, the American Southeast today. Um, it doesn't happen. Um, he has a brother called the Prophet, and I'll explain kind of what happens. Um, and so Tecumseh was, was gone down to the south um, to try to recruit the Cherokees and the Creeks particularly, and his brother, the prophet, whose name is, is got a, a, a long name, I have trouble pronouncing. Um, they were um, had a bunch of warriors that were not wanting to assimilate into white society, um, kind of converged on what's called Prophet's Town. And Tecumseh had told his brother specifically, do not fight the Americans till I get back. OK, I gave him specific instructions. Uh, mostly it was Shawnee and, and Tecumseh and his brother were Shawnee, which is very is a powerful tribe uh, in the Midwest. And um, what ends up happening is the governor of Indiana, a guy by the name of, of William Henry, Henry Harrison, um, wanted to try to, to dislodge Native Americans. Now, Harrison is going to actually become president of the United States and really became president of the United States because of his war record. And he gets the nickname Old Tip of Canoe from what actually happens. And so um, Harrison is uh, wanting to stop this um, Native American Confederation. And so he marches on um, Prophetstown. Now I want to show you a picture. Here's Tecumseh. This is a most famous painting of him. In fact, uh, one of the textbooks I've used previously has him on the cover. Uh, as I've told you before, there's a, a um, statue of Tecumseh at the United States Naval College um, in Maryland, uh, in Annapolis. And I'll tell you, you, you don't, have a statue of your enemy um, unless you got mad respect for him. So um, he is very much revered in American history. He dies tragically in, in the War of 1812. But um, 
he is supplied by the British. He does lead this Indian cultural renewal, and it was successful. Um, but in 1809, while he was gone, uh, Harrison and uh, um, attacks him to try to basically um, convince him to quit attacking American settlements. Okay. Um, and this is a, a famous quote from Tecumseh, sell a country. Why not sell the air, the clouds, the great sea, as well as the earth? Did not the great spirit make them for the use of his children? He's arguing like, you can't just buy this land from us. This is ours. Okay. And um, so while he's away, um, his brother, the prophet, um, saw a solar eclipse. Okay. Uh, and so this solar eclipse convinced the prophet that it was a sign from you know, the spirit world that they're going to be victorious, even though they don't have all their warriors that they're needing. And he fights against Harrison and he loses. And so anyway, I've had a student point out, well, Mr. Mr. Gore, if that was a solar eclipse, it was, it was black or darkens the sun. It's shown that he's going to lose or something. Well, who knows? Uh, but this is a quote from William E. Harrison, the guy who also fights Tecumseh himself later, uh, which I think is, is kind of a fascinating quote. It says one of those uncommon geniuses, who spring up occasionally to produce revolutions and overturn the established order of things for not for the vicinity of the United States. He would pre perhaps be the founder of an empire that would rival uh, in glory that of Mexico. Now that's a, an, an impressive quote and an expressive compliment against your enemy. So he's very much respected. Now, um, Harrison, about a thousand troops burned the town to the ground. It kind of uh, led to other warriors not joining his cause, and it kind of weakens his chance at developing a confederation. Now, there were two young congressmen who are going to be famous in American history. We'll, we'll start talking about them here, but that we will talk about them all the way until uh, into the 1850s when they die. Um, they're both Southern uh, congressmen. They're both slave owners. Calhoun, when you think of like a South Carolina wealthy planter, who represents everything about slave, um, slaveocracy or, or this uh, uh, plantation elite, John Calhoun is your man. Uh, Henry Clay runs for president three times. He is 0 for 3. I've had students ask me over the years as we've covered him a lot, uh, Mr. Gore, when is Clay going to die? Because uh, they're tired of hearing about him. But he, he does make a big splash in American history. Probably uh, one of the most qualified men to become president who, who just didn't. He was 0 for 3. But um, his arts nemesis politically is uh, Old Hickory, Andrew Jackson. But these young men, when they were young, um, elected to Congress, they wanted war and invasion of Canada. And the reason why they wanted invasion of Canada, they thought if, if they eliminated the British threat in Canada entirely, Canada and the British there cannot arm the Native Americans. If they can't arm them, then we can drive them out and settle their lands. So they're calling for war, and that's why they get the nickname Warhawks. So later in U.S. history, too, if you're in favor of, of um, Vietnam War, you're a war hawk. And if you're, uh, if you're uh, opposed to it, you're a dove. That's what the term comes from. Okay. Now, um, so here's the reason why they want a war. I kind of covered this, but want to wipe out the Indian resistance of Tecumseh and the Indian Confederation. They want to defend American rights. They thought the rights to move into this land, which... On paper, in European law, it was theirs because of Treaty of Paris 1783, but logically, um, it was somebody else's. But in the Europeans' view, if nobody was actually cultivating the land and did not, in their minds, possess the land, then therefore they did not own the land. Well, they were there for generations. So, But in their minds, these war hawks said you defend American rights. Want to gain more territory. They want the, the great fertile farmland of the Midwest and also the American Southeast, which are great farmlands. It's some of our bread baskets of our country. Um, and the other thing they want war is, which was a valid reason of all these, was the most valid reason is a revenge for impressment of American sailors by the British Navy. Okay. Now, James Madison, he, he um, kind of an interesting president, you know, father of our Constitution, supposedly, at least came up with a lot of it, um, was a Virginia guy, former Secretary of State, educated Princeton. Very qualified man, um, was not a good public speaker like Jefferson, very shy and introverted. Um, his wife, Dolly, was kind of the bubbly personality, so kind of opposite to Tract. And he actually, even though he's kind of kind of meek and, and uh, quiet, he actually is the only president to command troops in battle during a war, which is pretty boss. So, um, but anyway, he is going to be a little more aggressive um, than Jefferson in defending American neutrality. 
All right, so he, we talked about the Hunter Courts Act, created everybody would separate in France. Then he passes this random bill called Macon's Bill Number Two. I don't know why they call it Macon's Bill Number Two, I, I, other than than the person who proposed it in Congress was the last name Macon, but nonetheless, it's a weird name. Um, but basically, it said, "All right, we will trade with Britain or France if whichever one will agree to stop impressing our sailors first. Now, so this happens in 1810 when it gets passed. We fight the War of 1812, obviously in 1812. Um, the reason why we don't go to war with France and we go to war with Britain is because France, by 1811, 1812, says that they will agree to stop impressment if the British do. Okay, British wouldn't even return our reply. So we go to war with Britain, plus they are the Native Americans. That's two reasons instead of just one with France. And so that's what leads to the War of 1812. Now, um, so we, we basically developed political ties with France. Of course, Napoleon didn't really care about that. Um, he tries to invade Russia and it fails. Uh, actually, he's victorious, but as he's retreating, his men don't have food and that they're dealing with the harsh winter and uh, the Russian army kind of follows them all the way and, and kind of picks them off as they go. So we talked about impressment and what it is. It's terrible. It's kidnapping. Okay. So uh, Madison um, runs for reelection after he won in 1808. Okay. So really the issue between 1808 and 1812 is um, pretty much what do we do about the conflict in Europe and the Native Americans? Now, there is some important Supreme Court cases we're going to get to in a later lecture, but that happens during Madison's presidency. But I kind of covered them uh, in Module 3, but with a different lecture. And so you look at the, the states that are in favor of Madison are a lot of Western states at that time, heavily farming states, with the exception of Vermont. Uh, Maryland's kind of divided, but uh, the Federalist candidate basically wins New England, and that's about it. And it won't be long. Eight years later, the Federalists are going to be done. So um, what ends up happening is Britain just refuses to stop impressing uh, our, our American sailors. Uh, Madison goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war. Now, New England is opposed to it. In fact, they threatened secession, almost did. If it wasn't for the Treaty of Ghent, the end of the war, and the Battle of New Orleans, New England might have. Um, but they sympathized with England because, you know why? They made a lot of money trading with England. And um, the Federalists also opposed that the taking of Canada the reason for that is they don't want new farming states. Now, granted, the Federalists didn't realize that Canada has got a ton of other resources and that there's not a whole lot of farming uh, lands there. There are some, but not a ton. And so um, they, they didn't want that. And um, they didn't like that a lot of Democrat Republicans sympathized with Napoleon. They thought he was a bad dude. And they feared more farming states and farmers tend to vote Democrat Republican. So uh, here's the thing that, that Madison claimed we fought for, defending neutrality, freedom of the seas, defend our self-interest. Similar reasons we're going to fight in World War I. So we go to War, uh, war of 1812 to defend our neutrality. And um, like I said, France agreed to – France agreed to um, – at least stop impressing if the British will agree to, and France is not armed the Americans. So you have two reasons to fight the British and only one to fight the French. All right. Now, um, since our country is divided, you have New England who's opposed the war and then the other two thirds of the country support it. Basically, um, we're going to send off a three prong attack. Now the war of 1812 of all the wars we fight in American history is a disaster. Um, technically on paper, we don't lose it, uh, but we certainly don't win it. The British end up burning down our own capital, capital building and the White House. Uh, in fact, they don't even, uh, they don't burn down the White House until they drink all of uh, President Madison's wine, eat all of his food, then they burn it down. But um, what's, what's interesting is we sent a three-pronged attack into Canada. So the United States actually invaded Canada four times in American history. Now, none of those times were they actually Canada. It was a, a British colony. Okay, in Canada. But uh, of the three prong attack, uh, only one is partly successful. One burns down the city of York, which is modern day Toronto. My parents just got back from there about a week ago and uh, loved it. It's a huge, huge bustling city. Um, tons of stuff going on there. But um, at that time, it was called York. The other two invasions are a disaster. Okay, in fact, the New England, um, who raised a force, 
when they get to uh, New York, they refuse to cross over the border into Canada. And so half our army even don't even go because they kind of betrayed um, U.S. forces and trust there. So three-part invasion of Canada fails. We are not prepared. There's really no training. And the British pretty much beat the snot out of us, except for the burning of York and the Battle of Thames. Now, uh, if you remember in Indiana, William and Harrison had beaten Tecumseh's brother at Tippecanoe. It was on the Tippecanoe River. That's where he got the nickname Tippecanoe. Um, he is going, his forces from Indiana are going to defeat the um, Tecumseh and his forces at the Thames River, okay, which is right near uh, the Canada, Canada and Michigan border. And uh, what ends up happening um, is Tecumseh is killed there. So that's successful, the Battle of Thames and the burning of York, but pretty much everywhere else doesn't do well. Now, what's surprising is that we do really well in the Navy. Okay. Now, so if any of you former naval students um, of mine have been serving in the United States Navy, you'll take great pride in that. We didn't have a Navy to even speak of much, and we're fighting the biggest Navy in the world. In fact, on the Great Lakes, we actually defeated the British um, because there was later going to be an invasion force that was crossing Lake Erie to invade New York, and our United States Navy actually stopped them. And had they been successful, they would have gone to New York, captured and burned to the ground. The other invasion force who comes up and burns D.C. that goes up to Baltimore, Fort McHenry holds on, and that's where you see um, Francis Scott Key while on a slave ship, not a slave ship, but a prison ship, had just witnessed the Fort McHenry holding strong against the British, and that's where he wrote the, the famous song, The Star Spangled Banner, bombs bursting in air and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we're pre unprepared. Invasion of Canada failed, except for the burning of York and the winner, winning at the Battle of Thames. Uh, we look like a bunch of bums. Okay, plain and simple. We didn't fight the war well. We got whipped militarily. The Native Americans all fought on behalf of the British if they were up in the Midwest. Um, and the only reason why Britain just didn't take it to us and capture a bunch of our territory is this. They were fighting Napoleon. So when Napoleon advocates the throne in 1813-1814 time period, um, he goes out of Elba. And so that frees up a bunch of British soldiers who are, by the way, veterans and experienced in combat to go fight in the Americas. So there is a two prong attack, one that crosses the Great Lakes, one that, that goes to the Chesapeake Bay to attack the United States. Um, and it, other than the Navy saving us on Lake Erie, otherwise we probably would have completely lost the War of 1812. Instead, we just come out looking like it was a draw. Um, so Harrison kills Tecumseh there. And therefore, the last kind of ditch hope or, you know, last chance at, at having an Indian Confederation in the Midwest fails with Tecumseh. Okay. Here's some more images of the War of 1812. They had interesting tall hats. Here's another one. You can see Indians are involved in this conflict. Um, so Thomas Macdonough. Uh, defeated on Lake Champlain. I think I said Lake Erie earlier. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was a battle on Lake Erie, but the one that actually was an invasion force was on uh, Lake Champlain, which is pretty cool that we stopped him there. Here's some water uh, color painting of some of the, the naval battles. My favorite president, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, wrote like a three volume set on the naval war, War of 1812. I don't know how you can write one book on the naval aspect of War of 1812. Man, what three? Um, now, we're going to explain what happens in the South and Andrew Jackson a little bit later, um, but because he's going to play an important role with the Tennessee Volunteers. Those massive ships the British had. I don't know how we did as well as we did with the, um, against the British Navy. We had a scrappy Navy, I'll tell you that. You can see a lot of times they'll shoot holes through their sails and try to prevent them from escaping. Here's some of the famous commanders of uh, the War of 1812. I put images of them. Their uniforms are kind of interesting, tall, long, necks, and uh, so forth. There's Francis Scott Key. And uh, one of my favorite lines of any American in the war um, from Oliver Hazard Perry, which I love his middle name. Uh, his ship is going down, and he's he's boards his rowboat, and he's going over to another ship, and he, he yells, I have not yet begun to fight. Um, so he is not out of the fight yet. The man had grit, and I love it. Um, and so really, from the, a global perspective, the War of 1812 didn't mean diddly squat. Um, as my dad would like to say, it um, 
had really no impact on what thing was going on globally. In fact, Europe, uh, being sick of, of fighting Napoleon, actually plays into our, our um, advantage because they encourage the British to sue for peace so hopefully they can be peace and no more war. Now, Napoleon does come out of exile in 1814, um, or end of 1814, and then makes for one last hurrah in 1815, and ends up losing in a three-day battle called the Battle of Waterloo. Um, and Napoleon is exiled for good off the co off an island off the coast of East Africa where he dies. Now, uh, when the British, um, they defeat an American force near the Chesapeake Bay, south of Washington, D.C., Madison commanded an artillery uh, unit to fight against the British. The British just mopped the floor with us. Um, there is a, a famous story that Dolly Madison, the first lady, um, escaped with the White House with the famous painting that is in the White House today of George Washington. Now, there's conflicting stories about this because Madison um, did own a slave. Um, he treated him very well. Uh, he was very educated. In fact, uh, Madison's slave really liked Madison a lot, and but didn't like Dolly. Now, it was ironic because Dolly was beloved by a lot of people. She was a social butterfly at social events, but suppose she wasn't very nice to him. And um, he actually uh, claimed in his diary that he um, carried it out. Most likely that's probably correct, but it's, it's hard to verify uh, one way or the other. He didn't like Dolly, and he really more writes about it later when she gets credit for saving it. So he could have just been uh, you know, bitter at her. Uh, who knows? But nonetheless, either he or... Um, she saved the famous painting of George Washington. So the White House that uh, the president currently resides in and the Capitol building that our Congress currently resides in is actually the second of both because the British burned down our original. Now, typically, when you lose your capital, you lose the war. Okay, but two things go into helping us. One is that Napoleon has been defeated and in and, uh, and exile in the Isle of Elba before he makes his one last hurrah at the Battle of Waterloo. And Europe kind of uh, convinces the British that they need to end war. And then secondly, the British are like, all right, then what are we going to gain out of this? You know, we beat up on the Americans, so what? Do we want to ca capture a bunch of territory and have a bunch of unruly colonists again? And so they agree to peace at the Treaty of Ghent. Now, this is Francis Scott Key. He's not standing on the bow of the ship. Um, he would have been um, below looking out a prison window. But it's a cool painting. And this is the painting of, of Fort McHenry getting bombed by the British. I have been there. It's pretty cool. Now let's talk about Old Hickory. Okay, now Andrew Jackson becomes the hero of the War of 1812. Um, and a lot of the, the stuff he does that's heroic is actually after the war ends. But they didn't know the war was over. So um, Jackson actually, before the war broke out, had been sent with the Tennessee Volunteers, which is where the University of Tennessee's mascot comes from, and uh, were sent to uh, attack the Creek Indians, who it's called the Creek Wars, had been attacking settlers. Now, the Creeks had done some, some terrible things. Some of them had, um, and it's sometimes called Weatherford's War. I used to make my high school students read a chapter from this book called A Nation Rising about Weatherford's War. It's a fascinating story. Uh, Weatherford was actually half Native American, half white. And a lot of the men who fought for him were that way. They'd intermarried with they'd mar with, with white uh, fur trappers and so forth. And um, they had attacked a uh, fort that some settlers had, had sought safe refuge there. And I mean, and they just slaughtered them, you know, and butchered them and so forth. Now, Weatherford didn't order it. Um, he had actually told them not to, but anyway, it was beyond his control. And, um, so Jackson and the Tennessee Volunteers were dispatched down there to, to put an end to that. Um, they fought Weatherford and uh, beat him. Weatherford escaped. And the next day, he turned himself in, walked into Andrew Jackson's tent to hand him his sword to surrender, expecting Jackson to, um, to basically execute him. Jackson was so impressed with his bravery and honor to do that, he released him. Um, also, uh, one of those battles in the Creek War, um, Jackson actually found an infant Native American boy um, and raised him as his own son um, until he died of tuberculosis, tuberculosis at the age of 28. Jackson's kind of an interesting guy. He, he hated the Indians because they support the British and the, the American Revolution, and his mom and brother had died in the American Revolution. His mom died from illness, and his, his, his brother died in the British prison. And he had the British morning, but it did anybody else because what happened to his family. But the Native Americans were a close second. And 
he he disliked him for fighting on the side of the of the British, but yet he raised a Native American boy as his own son. I mean, he's just and he loved children. He'd get on the ground and play with them. And um, here he is, this rough and tough old guy. He shot and killed six people in a duel, um, which where he dueled at was actually legal at the time. Uh, and um, but yet loved his wife deeply. Um, so I always tell students, whether you love him or hate him, there's not much in between. Andrew Jackson's kind of one of the most polarizing figures in American history. You got to admit, he's one of the most fascinating American presidents and uh, represented this frontier American spirit and so forth. So let me show you a map, the, the best way to uh, illustrate this. So um, Jackson had uh, beat the Creeks um, at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Okay. Um, and then because of the War of 1812, uh, here the British are trying to capture New Orleans. That's our most important port city at this time until New York surpasses it with the opening of the Erie Canal. So he goes down into Florida uh, to Pensacola and then comes through Mobile and then it goes over to New Orleans. And he's outnumbered about four to one, three to one, something like that. And um, Jackson actually gets the high ground, which is not much around New Orleans, but he does get the high ground and repels three British attacks. And just really the British had mopped the floor with us, except in our Navy throughout the war of 1812 in this battle, we annihilated the British, but it was two weeks after the treaty of Ghent had been signed, but you got to realize the treaty of Ghent was signed in December of 1814. This happened in January of 1815. It takes like over a month to get news back across the Atlantic. And then it's going to take several weeks to get the news from new Orleans up to DC. Literally, the, the news of the Battle of New Orleans arrived at the same time the news of the Treaty of Ghent. Okay. And so that's kind of fascinating. This is a, a picture of the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Okay. And really, the, the first hundred years of American history, this is considered the greatest victory. Uh, well, first 75 years, I'd say. The, the greatest victory will be during the American Civil War. Uh, but, uh, but the Battle of New Orleans was, was a tremendous victory. Okay. Here's a, a painting of Andrew Jackson, 1815, and uh, his men kind of uh, behind defensive positions at the Battle of New Orleans um, and so forth. Now, the Treaty of Ghent is what ends the War of 1812. And it was kind of considered a fought to a draw. What's crazy is the United States doesn't lose any territory. The United States doesn't gain any territory, now it is Britain. Um, but what they do get is probably what was very important to them was respect. That's why I call it the War of Respect. Now, uh, for a number of decades, the Great Lakes between the U.S. and the United States um, is going to be uh, heavily armored. Um, and we have boats patrolling the Great Lakes, you know, British against us, us against the British. And then today, you know, it's the, it's the longest un, um uh, undefended border anywhere in the world. We have a great relationship with Canada. So um, here's the effects of the War of 1812. So the causes are two uh, are easy. Impressment and Britain Norman, the Native Americans on the frontier. All right, the, the results are the United States gets respect. Tremendous nationalism comes out of this. Americans are really patriotic and proud to be an American after this. And um, we kind of are seen as now um, working on our own economically. We also began uh, adopting uniquely American literature, uniquely American art, um, and we become uniquely American culturally. We're no longer very similar. I almost look the same as the British. Uh, we develop uniquely American literature styles. Um, so you may take like an American literature course in college, um, or you may take a world literature course uh, and so forth. And you can kind of compare, you can take a British literature course and so forth. <clears throat> and it's the war of 1812 that kind of helped spur that. Um, and you know, the country is united, um, for the most part after the war of 1812. Now during the war, things were not that way. The federalists met in Hartford, Connecticut to basically work out a separate peace agreement with England or threatened succession because they were tired of not making money by being able to trade with the British. They didn't support the war. They didn't support what the Warhawks were wanting in Canada. And so when they go to Washington to present their um, grievances and their demands, literally, they arrive at Washington about the same time as the news of the Treaty of Ghent. The war's over. Okay, so they look like idiots. 
And then secondly, news of the Battle of New Orleans comes and, and Americans are celebrating in the, in the streets. And so it ends the Federalist Party. So by 1820 was the last election they had any candidate running for office. So uh, anyway, but there's some of the proposals they were going for. You don't have to know any of those. You just need to know what the Hartford Convention was. It was uh, ends up leading to the death of the Federalist Party, but it's their attempt to try to create a separate peace agreement with the with the British and, and uh, demand these things from the U.S. government. Are they going to threaten to secede? So um, as I've, I've kind of covered this, but I'll recap: um, we gain respect. That's important. Uh, eventually, Canada is going to become not initially, but later on down the road, Canada is going to become a great neighbor. Uh, Federalist Party is done. You'll see a new party replace it later uh, in the early uh, 1830s, kind of emerges a little bit in the late 1820s, called the Whig Party. Um, just talk of nullification and secession New England. Set uh, an example that the South is going to follow later uh, in American history. And uh, we became neutral and isolated from the rest of Europe for a while until we get into some conflicts Um uh, in the late 1900s and early 1900s, one of those being World War I. Uh, Native Americans in the West are um, lost one of their most powerful allies, the British. Um, it's not like that they, the British no longer support them entirely, but they gave up on, the, on, on relying on the British, and uh, they gave up more and more land as time goes along, and that'll be a common trend throughout U.S. history. More U.S. factories are going to be built. You're going to have two heroes uh, in American history that come out of this have become future president, Jackson and Harrison. Um, Americans love a good war hero. I think Winfield Scott's one of the only war heroes in American history that's ever lost an election. And um, patriotism is rock, rock, rock and rolling. And we have a new era called the era of good feelings because there's not, not a whole lot of conflict, at least on paper. Now there will be some conflict dealing with the issue of slavery. So that will conclude this lecture, and we will start uh, talking about the era of good feelings in the next recorded lecture.